want to talk about today is violence and state failure and their relationship to development. So violence, both political violence and criminal violence, um, are a big problem that a lot of people face every day in the developing world, um, like these protesters that you see here in Liberia. But the questions we want to ask um, are first, how do things like war, political conflict, or even criminal violence impact development? Um, so we know they're bad, but do they actually, are they actually a key cause of poverty? Could they keep countries poor? Um, we also want to know what happens when a state becomes a failed state. So what happens when the state is unable to control violence and provide for people's basic needs? Things like infrastructure and social services. We could also ask a third question that's not up here. Um, how do issues of violence and war and political conflict differ in the developing world? How do they look different in the developing world compared to the developed world? So before we go any further, we should just uh, briefly discuss a few key terms that you all looked at in your reading. So when we talk about political violence, we're just talking about um, violence carried out in an organized fashion, usually, to achieve some kind of political end. So oftentimes it's carried out by a state, um, by the military or even the police force. So we could think about wars between states or civil wars where the military is fighting some against some insurgent group or something like that. Um, we could even um, think about violence carried out by the state um, in terms of like political repression, repressing dissidents or something like that, maybe through the police. We could also talk about political violence carried out by non-state actors. Um, so terrorist groups um, carrying out violence uh, with specific political aims or rebel groups, things like that. So political violence could be carried out by um, state or non-state actors. We could talk about um, the difference between interstate and intrastate, or what I'll call civil violence. Um, so civil and intrastate mean the same thing. Um, both of these kinds of violence are um, important in LDCs. So interstate violence is, uh, you could think about wars between countries. So you could think about, for example, the Uganda and Tanzania war, um, which was in the late 70s, fought between those two countries that led to the overthrow of Idi Amin's regime. Um, but we, so that's an interstate war. A civil conflict is, is fought within the borders of a country. So an example of a civil conflict could be something like the, the Naxalite insurgency in northeastern India, um, where Maoist insurgents uh, are still and have for a while um, waged war against the government, wishing to eventually overthrow it. So that's not between two different states. That's within one state, um, the state versus this rebel group. So that's civil conflict. Um, and generally, when we uh, distinguish between just political violence and war, um, we usually say a conflict that... Uh, causes like more than a thousand casualties in a year um, is, is a war. And if it's below that, we just call it a conflict. So that's a definition from your book. Um, it, it's not super important. Um, I'll use conflict kind of to mean uh, all kinds of different things, both small scale conflicts and wars. But usually if we say war, we mean a, a larger conflict, either a, an interstate war or a civil war. We could talk about all different kinds of violence, different kinds of motivations. So this could be unrest and violence between ethnic groups, um, disputes over territory between states, um, secessionist movements where, where uh, one part of the territory wishes to secede from the rest of the country and create their own state. So, so an example of that um, would be like, uh, we could talk about the conflict 
attempting to create the Republic of Biafra out of Nigeria, um, which was unsuccessful. <clears throat> and again, we could even talk about just repression of dissidents. So a big pattern that we're going to see is that interstate war um, is rare, and it's becoming increasingly rare, whereas civil conflict um, is this kind of persistent problem in the developing world. So here's what that looks like. Um, so this is a figure right from your book. Um, it doesn't quite go up to present day. It goes up to, looks like 2008. And we can see, so the red line is interstate wars um, across the entire developing world, the, the number of them in each year. So this number never exceeds 10 in this time period, never more than 10 interstate wars in any year. Um, sometimes it's zero. Uh, oftentimes it's around, you know, five or six wars in a year, interstate wars. And then the colored bands are civil wars. So we can see there are many more civil wars going on at any given time. At any given time, um, even the number of, of civil wars in like just South Asia is usually more than the number of interstate wars all around the world. <clears throat> and so we see some patterns here that, um, at least in this time period, East Asia tends to have the lowest number of civil wars, um, followed by Latin America, and then the Middle East, and then South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa um, during this time period always has the most, uh, the most civil wars or civil conflicts um, at any given time um, by far. So, so many times more civil wars um, during most years in Sub-Saharan Africa than in East Asia. We could also talk about um, criminal violence. So when we talk about criminal violence, we're talking about violence that could be either unorganized or organized. So we could talk about organized crime um, carried out by um, you know, drug cartels or things like that. Um, structured groups of individuals who profit from illegal activity are carrying out this kind of violence. Um, and then when we talk about rates of unorganized violence, we're talking about all other kinds of violent crime, including um, crimes of passion and things like that. So here we can see um, for 2008 the average homicide rates um, in every world region. Um, and we can see something really stands out here, that Latin America and the, and the Caribbean and Sub-Saharan Africa have by far the highest rates of homicide um, per 100,000 people compared to all these other world regions. So um, in terms of homicides, the Middle East and North Africa is actually pretty close to the same rate as the high-income OECD countries like ours, or like like uh, you know countries in Europe or things like that. Um, whereas Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa are way up there. So um, this is probably for different reasons um, in each region. So most of it's believed that most of the murders in Africa are uh, the result of unorganized crime crimes of passion or um, kind of small-scale street crime not carried out by gangs or drug cartels or things like that. Um, whereas Latin America has a lot of organized crime, um, as you've all probably heard about, um, due to the drug trade. So, so coca comes from South America, um, from Colombia, Bolivia, Peru, and... Um, Drugs, including coca, are smuggled by land through Central America. Um, Mexico has a booming industry involving all kinds of drugs, as we saw in Breaking Bad. And um, drug cartels and drug gangs are using violence um, oftentimes as their main method of, of conflict resolution. Um, so, so, like, 
yeah, it's true that these two regions have have similar homicide rates, but they have very different um, very different kinds of violence happening. Um, Latin America is more organized crime, whereas Sub-Saharan Africa is more unorganized violent crime. And then the final term that we want to talk about and get clear before we move on is state failure. So when we talk about state failure, um, we talk about really extreme cases where a state becomes a failed state, where it loses its authority and general ability to govern um, all or at least much of its territory. So why do we talk about state failure when we talk about violence? Well, because they tend to go hand in hand. Um, so uh, we often see failed states in really violent areas. Uh, in countries where maybe there's a civil war or insurgencies that have really um, inhibited the state, uh, really undermined the state's ability to actually govern. <clears throat> so the idea of a failed state isn't a hard and fast category. Uh, people could disagree about um, when a state actually is a failed state. Because remember, it's the state losing its ability to govern. But oftentimes, there is some government that's doing something, maybe in, in only part of the country or something like that. Um, many LDCs have a lot of um, government ineffectiveness. Uh, so <clears throat> it's not exactly like, a, like clear when a state is a failed state. But we could look at Somalia as kind of a, an informative example. So the USC regime um, came into power in the early 90s, uh, but it isn't recognized as legitimate in most of the country, and it's continually embattled in armed conflicts by, opposi by opposition groups. Um, and many of these opposition groups, many of these insurgencies, um, control specific regions of the country. And so as a result, the central government basically governs Mogadishu, the capital, um, but some other parts of the country are governed by different rebel groups or by nobody at all. Um, and so you can imagine that even the provision of basic services like water and infrastructure and building roads is difficult or impossible in, in much of this country. So that's kind of what a failed state looks like. Okay. So why might we theorize that political violence um, could cause underdevelopment? Well, it turns out that political violence, and especially war, um, have economic and human costs and social costs that are just enormous. So think about even just infrastructure. Uh, when there is or has been a major conflict, um, infrastructure like water lines, or pipelines, electricity infrastructure, roads could be either destroyed or hard to build or both. Um, think about public health. So I don't want to shock you, but war makes people die. So there's ob obviously like that public health impact of just the casualties of the war. Um, but even aside from just people getting harmed in the conflict or in the crossfire, um, conflict can have huge effects on the distribution of food. Um, if roads are getting destroyed or it's unsafe for vehicles to travel through certain parts of the country, it's hard to transport food. And so you could see famines going along with wars. Um, you could see effects on the functioning of clinics and, and things like that. Um, if clinics are getting destroyed or they can't get supplies or they're losing electricity. You could see effects on water infrastructure, the destruction of water infrastructure, so that people start to lack cl uh, clean water, um, which we already know has huge impacts on people's health. And so we tend to see higher infant mortality rates, higher maternal mortality rates, 
in states that are experiencing or have recently experienced conflict, and of course, um, just lower life expectancies as well. So these effects on public health don't stop when people stop shooting at each other. Even when um, there's a ceasefire or when there's a resolution of the conflict, some of these public health impacts that work through the destruction of infrastructure and things like that could last for years. And we already know that if war causes famine or um, could cause people to be malnourished because they can't access food, that's a public health impact that can last a long time, right? Because when people aren't getting the right nutrition growing up, um, that has kind of impacts on their development, on their brain development and things like that, um, and on their general health that last that could last into adulthood. We could also talk about displacement. So in these situations, many people are going to be fleeing their homes to escape violence. Um, if they move outside the country, they're refugees. If they go somewhere else in the country, they're IDPs, which are internally displaced persons. And many of these people end up in camps, like refugee camps. The conditions in these camps tend to be horrible. Um, IDPs in these camps might lack sanitation, water, food, medical care. These camps often have crime and violence. Uh and are unsafe for women. And so that creates a situation where people flee war and go to places that are often unlivable and ungovernable. So that's a huge impact on human development, on people's daily living conditions. You could also see a loss of investment. So another mechanism that this works through is investment. Foreign investors or MNCs often will pull their investments out of a country when there's a conflict because they're afraid of losing their investments or, or losing the lives of their um, employees that they have to send there. Um, and people in the, in the country may not be as willing to start businesses and stuff um, if they're living under the threat of war. So maybe there's a loss of trust or maybe just a lack of infrastructure, a lack of physical security, makes it harder for people to start productive businesses. We also see an obvious loss of human capital. So obviously, there's a loss of human capital when a lot of people who could be productive are being killed. Um, many of these young people um, would be part of the workforce if not for the war. And because of the war or the conflict, they're either busy fighting the war, being destructive, or they're, you know, dead. And so that's a loss of human capital. <clears throat> we also see higher costs of exchange. So conflict is going to make travel difficult and risky and cause mistrust. And so people are less likely to exchange with each other. Uh, finally, there's a fiscal burden. So if a country is at war, they're spending a tremendous amount of money probably on fighting that war. And so they might be um, borrowing, going into debt in order to fund that war, and they might be diverting money away from social welfare spending, spending on health and education um, that might be good for development. So, <clears throat> so I like the example that Baker uses of uh, the Civil War in Mozambique, which was almost 20 years long. So civil wars tend to be longer than interstate wars, and they tend to recur more. And this was a pretty long war. So what do some of these costs that I've talked about look like? Look like? What do some of these mechanisms look like? So in terms of physical capital, about one third of retail shops, um, about half of government buildings, a lot of water infrastructure, electricity infrastructure was destroyed in this war. People lost cattle. People lost their businesses. People um, were forced to abandon um, their homes and their farms. Uh, talk about the, the burden on um, FDI and the loss of investment. Um, it's estimated that, that about 
60% of FDI um, was canceled in Mozambique due to this civil war. So that's, that's MNCs pulling out of the country because it's not safe or stable. Um, an astounding one-third of citizens in Mozambique were displaced, um, so that's not good. Schools were destroyed. Um, children were harmed. People were killed. Like, all this stuff that we're talking about, um, this is what it looks like. <clears throat> and the fiscal burden. So the government predictably raised taxes on the population, which many of them are poor, and, and borrowed and went into debt, um, took on a huge amount of debt in order to finance this war. So that's not really good for the economy, right? We can easily see how uh, that's bad for development. It would be hard to say um, that it's not. We could also talk about not just the mechanisms, but the empirical evidence for some kind of relationship between political violence, war, and development. And so, first of all, we see, um, so there's this book by Collier called The Bottom Billion. I thought about assigning that for you guys, but I, I changed my mind. But basically, what he points out is that if you look at the poorest billion people in the world, <clears throat> Most of them live in a country that has experienced a major conflict in recent years, or is experiencing one now. So the poorest people in the world tend to live in places where there's conflict. We also see that when we look at countries, poverty rates have fallen in countries that have not experienced major conflicts in recent years. But if we look at just the countries um, that have experienced major conflicts in recent years, uh, poverty rates have not fallen. And another thing that Collier points out in his book is that we tend to see the worst effects um, of violence on development when it's civil war rather than interstate war. And that's for a number of different reasons. One, if your country is having a civil war, that means that all of the action is happening within your borders. Whereas, like, say you're fighting a neighboring country, maybe some of that battlefield is in the other country too. So you could think about, like, you're kind of sharing the destruction in a way. Um, another reason that civil wars tend to be worse for development is that um, they tend to last longer. As I've already said, they tend to last a lot longer. And they tend to recur a lot more. So many civil wars um, go away for a while. They, there's some kind of ceasefire or resolution of the conflict, and then they recur a few years later. And so that's why um, Collier and some other people refer to civil war as development in reverse. Okay, so we talked about political violence, but what about criminal violence? How might that be related to development? So some of the mechanisms are like pretty the same, and some of them are different. So um, just as we saw with political violence, it might deter outside investment. So if you want to locate, uh, I don't know, a factory somewhere, and you're choosing between two countries where your costs are pretty similar in each country, but one country has a, maybe it's a country in Latin America, it has a much higher rate of violent crime, you may not choose the country with the higher rate of violent crime. You may choose to locate your plant somewhere else. Um, it's also true that violent crimes put a lot of pressure on the healthcare system, which is often already strained for resources in developing countries. Furthermore, um, just as we saw with political violence or with all kinds of um, other institutional problems, people might be prevented from taking risks and investing. So 
we say it over and over again that you're taking a risk when you um, try to expand your business or buy equipment to make your business more productive or things like that. Um, you're taking that risk and that risk is greater if there's crime happening, if you feel that there are you know, criminal people around who might take advantage of you, who might um, use violence against you in order to expropriate um, the, this investment that you've made. <clears throat> Finally, we have already talked about how property rights and the rule of law are really important for economic exchange, for um, investment, and things like that, and for growth. And it's these things are often uh, much more ineffective when there's extreme criminal violence, when there are really powerful drug cartels or something like that. <clears throat> they, that kind of violence might be so extreme that it undermines the courts and it undermines the security of people's property rights and it undermines um, law enforcement. And so because property rights and the rule of law are, are not um, effective anymore, <clears throat> we could see some effects of that on, on investment and growth and economic exchange. So it seems obvious, right, that, that violence is bad, that war is bad for people. Um, but it's like another thing to say that this kind of violence that we're talking about is a key cause of underdevelopment. So it may be that violence is a cause of human misery, but it's not actually keeping countries poor. So what are the critiques? We've, we've looked at the mechanisms and the potential evidence behind an effect of these kinds of violence on, um, on development, but what are the critiques of that theory that, that violence, either criminal or political, is a key cause of underdevelopment? Well, there are a few important ones. So I th what I think is the most important one, and this critique actually holds for both political and criminal violence, under unlike the other critiques that we're going to look at, which kind of only apply to political violence. You could apply this critique to both uh, political and criminal violence as, as a cause of underdevelopment. So the key critique here is that these kinds of conflict or violence may be endogenous to development. So what does that word endogenous mean? So I don't know if you've heard that in other classes. What it means is that maybe it's not the case that conflict and violence causes underdevelopment. Maybe it's actually underdevelopment that causes conflict and violence. So maybe we see more conflict and violence in poor countries because uh, poverty causes violence, not because um, violence causes poverty. So why would we think that poverty causes conflict and crime? So there are a few different uh, reasons. Um, so one reason is, is behavioral. So poor people tend to have less to lose and more to gain from both uh, criminal violence and political violence. So obviously, if you're poor, um, you have more of a reason to take the risks involved with profitable crime. That's not to say that, you know, poor people are inherently criminals, but obviously people are doing these crimes to, to make money. And so it's likely that um, people are going to be more prone to do that if they're more desperate. But we could also see the same pattern with political conflict. So if you have a country with a lot of poor people, you have probably, first of all, a lot of people with real grievances, um, a lot of people who are angry and will take up arms against the government in an insurgency or something like that, or a civil war. Um, furthermore, uh, fighting in a rebel army or or the, you know, the national army or a t even a terrorist group is a job to a lot of poor people. So there's really interesting research, I think that Baker actually mentions in the chapter, um, asking rebel soldiers about what their motivations are for fighting. And many, many people 
report um, joining the movement just to have a job, not for any ideological reason or really because of any grievance or because they believe in some cause, but because it's a job for them. So this is one way um, that having a big poor population might, um, might uh, set the stage for real explosive conflicts <clears throat> that gather a lot of people on, on both sides. So that's kind of the behavioral mechanism behind a call, like a, a, uh, an effect of, of poverty on violence, not the other way around. But we could also talk um, about a more governmental mechanism. So the government of a poor country is probably less able to control criminal or political violence. It's expensive to hire police to have courts, um, to hire people and buy munitions to fight rebels. Um, Central America has more gang members than soldiers. That's an expensive problem for the state. And so, again, it may be that we see more crime or more violence in these poor countries um, not because the crime or violence is keeping them poor, but because the poverty is allowing the violence to recur and to continue. And so it could be that there's some kind of poverty trap, some kind of vicious cycle in these countries where violence or crime and poverty are reinforcing each other. It could be um, that it's just one, a, like a single direction causal relationship where uh, poverty causes crime and violence, or it could be, um, as people have theorized, people like Collier, that um, that violence and crime causes poverty. We don't have the evidence yet to know which one of these stories is happening, um, where the which direction the ca causality goes, or if it goes in both directions. And so that's a critique of this theory that. Um, violence and crime cause underdevelopment. Another critique um, relates to um, the potential benefits, I guess you could say, of war, or at least of the cessation of war. So the cessation of war, when, when the war ends, um, this can sometimes draw in aid dollars. It can uh, boost certain economic activities like reconstruction, um, which can in turn boost a country's post-war revenue and growth. And so there is some evidence that post-war economies tend to grow very quickly. So depending on how strong that effect is, if that effect is really strong, if countries bounce back in a big way after conflicts, then that um, calls into question whether conflict actually keeps countries poor. Um, if they bounce back so quickly, then conflict can't be really the, the key explanation for why they're staying poor. So that's another critique. And notice that this one is just related to war and not related to things like criminal violence. And then finally, you all read about, and maybe in other classes, in international relations classes or things like that, have third, heard about these uh, bellicist, bellicist, sorry, bellicist theories. Um, so we associate this with the work of Charles Tilley, this political scientist. <clears throat> and basically, he argued that interstate war uh, was a catalyst for development in Europe. And so here's a quote from him. Going to war accelerated the move from indirect to direct rule. Almost any state that makes war finds that it cannot pay for the effort from its accumulated reserves and current revenues. Almost all war-making states borrow extensively, raise taxes, and seize the means of combat, including men, from reluctant citizens who have other uses for their resources. So what Tilly basically says in his book is that in an interstate war, 
So not civil wars, interstate wars. He's looking at interstate wars in Europe, um, like a long time ago. Um, I, I think he goes back to like the medieval era. Um, but he says that in these interstate wars, a government has to consolidate and centralize power so that they can raise taxes and do all the other things that they need to do in order to fight the war. So a war is a big effort. It requires you to gather people to fight the war and uh, gather money from people, so tax, raise taxes. And remember, when we talk about state capacity, as we've already talked about when we talked about institutions earlier this week, one of the key things that um, state capacity is, is just the ability of the state to raise revenues from the citizenry, to raise taxes. And so basically, Tilly thinks that um, it was going to war that motivated rulers in Europe to build the machinery and the bureaucracies necessary to gather taxes from people. And they also, um, it was also a motivation for them to consolidate power over remote parts of their territory in expectation of being invaded. And so the end result is high state capacity. Remember state capacity that we talked about on Monday. So to, to the extent that we think state capacity, the ability of the state to carry out its basic functions of taxation and building things and providing services to people, to the extent that we think that state capacity is important for development, Bellicists have argued that wars in the medieval eras are what led to high state capacity and eventually development as a result in Europe in the centuries that followed the medieval eras. <clears throat> and so Bellicists um, would say that because, because the medieval era in Europe was this time of warring between nation states, it caused these nation states to, to form and consolidate power Whereas um, during that time, we didn't see the same thing happening in, uh, to, to, to as great of a degree in, in other parts of the world. And so those places were not building state capacity. Uh, and so that might be um, why we see different kind of long-term trajectories of economic development that even persist today. So... <clears throat> So this is a critique basically saying um, it's not that war and violence inhibit development. Uh, actually, war and violence explain why the Western world developed more quickly when it did. That's what Bellicists say. So this is the last critique we learn of these theories that we talked about today. So that's all. That's a pretty short lecture, but it's actually a pretty straightforward topic.